A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 4 Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. No matter how good you are at something or how you rank your accomplishments, there is someone out there who makes you look incompetent. You're a good cook, but there are many good chefs. Some mafia don has a tackier yacht than you. Some obsessive CEO has a more complicated self-winding watch. This is something I realized early, playing basketball, dedicating my life towards one sport. You realize that no matter how hard you try or how much you practice or how much you love something and are passionate about it, there is always going to be someone better than you, smarter than you, quicker than you, faster than you, stronger than you for 99.999% of people in one domain. And if you, even if you're not good at that domain, if you're the best in that domain, well, there's a million other domains you're not good at. And there's other people better than you. It's really a humbling thought. It's the idea of who cares if you're Prime Minister of Canada when someone else is the President of the United States. In, inside us dwells a critical internal voice and spirit that knows all this. It's predisposed to make its noisy case. It condemns our mediocre efforts. It can be very difficult to quell. There is no shortage of tasteless artists, tuneless musicians, poisonous cooks, ideology-ridden professors, Awful music torments listeners everywhere. Poorly designed buildings crumble. The idea is that failure and mediocrity and substandard is the price we pay for standards. And because mediocrity has consequences both real and harsh, standards are necessary and they I think are a natural byproduct of creation. We are not equal in ability or outcome and never will be. A very small number of people produce very much of everything. And there's also the idea of the, a very small number of people produce most of the wealth. This is commonly known and statistically proven. The winners don't take all, but they take most and the bottom is not a good place to be. But when you're at the bottom, you can't help but compare yourself to those at the top and those above you. And even when you're at the top, it's kind of the extreme polarities. When you're at extreme ends of the, t of the, of the curve, uh, you can't help but compare yourself to others. It's quite interesting. Peterson proposes an alternative approach and the one that requires no illusions. If the cards are always stacked against you, if that's what you think, growing up, you know, no matter what you do, it's always stacked against you. Perhaps the game you're playing is somehow rigged. Perhaps by you, unbeknownst to yourself. I'm not exactly sure what he means by this. This is a book you have to read multiple times, ideas you have to absorb multiple times at different times, and that's something I'm not fully grasping but I highlighted this for a reason and if the internal voice makes you doubt the value of your endeavors or your life or life itself perhaps you should stop listening and that's what made me highlight it. I'm like okay perhaps we should just stop listening to this internal voice at times you know because there will always be people better than you and that's a cliche of nihilism like the phrase in a million years who's gonna know the difference I beg to differ, I definitely think in a million years people will know the difference. You drop a pebble in the water, you've left a ripple. It's a metaphor. No matter what you do, you are changing the course of history. It's like the butterfly effect. Everything matters. The proper response to that statement is not, well then everything is meaningless, because that is nihilism, that's in one sentence right there. It's, any idiot can choose a frame of time within which nothing matters. Talking yourself into irrelevance is not a profound critique of being. It's a cheap trick of the rational mind. And it's very easy in the midst of ooh, depression, anxiety, just a poor, undisciplined mentality. It's very easy to fall victim to that mentality without a proper uh, structure and framework um, of ideas and philosophies that bolster you against the tyranny of the world. You don't have that. Very easy to fall victim to that. Before we compare the nuances of comparing oneself to other people, Peterson illustrates that there's many platforms in which to succeed at. The world allows for many ways of being. If one doesn't work, you try another. You can pick something better matched to your unique mix of strength, weaknesses, and situation. And some people may think, 
I should be winning at everything. But winning at everything might only mean that you're not doing anything new or difficult. You might be winning, but you're not growing. And growing might be the most important form of winning. So it's this idea of that if you are constantly being successful, that may not be productive as well. That may be, excuse me, showing you something about the nuances of the the lane that you're playing within and the game you're playing and the level to which you are holding yourself to. It's very easy when you're constantly winning to have this inflated ego, paint this illusion of success and grandiosity. Now Peterson's gonna talk about comparisons, give you examples. Say your colleague outperforms your work, but his wife is having an affair while your marriage is stable and happy. Who has it better? The one has the, the profession that's working and one has the uh, home life that is not. The celebrity you admire is chronic drunk driver and a bigot. Is, he, is his life truly preferable to yours just because he's a celebrity? When the internal critic puts you down using such comparisons, here's how it operates. First, it selects a single arbitrary domain of comparison. This could be fame, money, power, appearance. Pick anything. And then it acts as if this domain is the only one that is relevant. This is what we do, we, we tunnel vision ourselves. Then it contrasts you unfavorably with someone truly stellar within that domain. So you kind of set yourself up for failure because you're, you're automatically subconsciously comparing yourself to the unfavorable domain. It can take that final step even further using the unbridgeable gap between you and its target of comparison as evidence for the fundamental injustice of life, aka the idea of nihilism. That way your motivation to do anything at all can be most effectively undermined and justified as well. Your poor performance and your unproductivity and, and, and lack of discipline can be justified by this delusion. This is a very thought-provoking thought. You have to understand how, you trap, how we trap ourselves in our minds. How do we do it? We do it by comparing ourselves unfavorably to a domain someone is excessively successful at, comparing them with our domain we are on the extreme, often opposite end that we are not successful at. On the other end, now we talk about the utility of comparison because sometimes it is productive. For example, when we are very young, we are neither individual nor informed. We have not had the time nor gained the wisdom to develop our own standards. In consequence, we must compare ourselves to others because standards are not necessary. Without them, there is nowhere to go and nothing to do. So as we mature, we become by contrast increasingly individual and unique. The conditions of our lives become more and more personal and less and less comparable with those of others. But you can see from infancy, we must compare. We need points of reference and we look for them subconsciously and consciously. Symbolically speaking, this means we must leave the house ruled by our father and confront the chaos of our individual being once we enter the world. We must then rediscover the value of our culture Veiled from us by ignorance, hidden in the dusty tre treasure trove of the past, rescue them and integrate them into our own lives. This is what gives existence its full and necessary meaning. And then one of the goals here would be to create our own standards instead of standards created by the comparison of others when we are in adulthood. So before we can articulate your own standards of value, you must see yourself as a stranger. You then must get to know yourself and ask a series of self-reflective, vulnerable honest questions. What do you find valuable or pleasurable? How much leisure, enjoyment and reward do you require so that you feel like more than a beast of burden? You could force yourself through the daily grind, you could watch the precious days tick by, or you could learn how to entice yourself into sustainable, productive activity. Do you ask yourself what you want? Do you negotiate fairly with yourself? Or are you a tyrant with yourself as a slave? So it's understanding, are you a slave to your own goals, to your own dreams? Are these dreams and goals you have manifestations of comparisons of other people? Is the foundation that they're built on as a result of something that's authentic and genuine from yourself and from something you've critically analyzed? Or is it instead from something that's been heavily influenced and poisoned and tarnished by 
others and uh, the greed and the dirty values that are fleeting. For example, as a kid, I would look at magazines and look at fast cars and nice houses and I would absorb this information from magazines and TV and whatever else I absorbed. I'd be like, I want that life. I want all that money. I want to be able to buy all those things, all these things. And as you can see, my young impressionable mind was being molded by a very rocky foundation of, of what? Superficiality. So we have to understand, I understood later throughout the years how, uh, how deluded uh, that, that opinion and perspective was and so I shifted it as I learned more about the world and, and, and educated myself more and had more experiences and so but many people into their adulthood at my age and beyond are a slave to themselves by building this foundation of delusion from superficiality and things alike to that so you have to dare instead to be dangerous to be truthful dare to be dare to articulate yourself and express or at least become aware of what would really justify your life? And by doing these, these reading this out loud, reading this book and doing things alike to this, creating these videos, I help go through this process to myself, which is why I love doing this so much. It's a very uh, cathartic, self-reflective, fulfilling process. And hopefully through other individuals watching and absorbing this, they can do this onto themselves. So you need to continue to question, what are the standards you want to live by? How do you need to be spoken to? What are you putting up with or pretending to like from due to your obligation? Consult your resentment. It's a, it's a revelatory emotion for all its pathology. Resentment always means one of two things. Either the resentful person is immature, in which case he or she should shut up, quit whining and get on with it, or there is tyranny afoot. In which case, the person subjugated has a moral obligation to speak up. Why? Because the consequence of remaining silent is worse. Silent resentment is poison. You do not, it's one of the worst things. Of course, it's easy in the moment to stay silent and avoid conflict, but in the long term, that's deadly. When you have something to say, silence is a lie. And tyranny feeds on lies. It's one of the most profound things in this, in this chapter right here. Silence, is it always a lie? Hmm. Not unless you speak truth at the end of it. The point of our eyes, or take stock. We can imagine new ways that things could be set right and improved, even if we have everything we thought we needed. Even when satisfied temporarily, we remain curious. So we always want, it's kind of the, the plight of the human being. Most people kind of always want more, hungering for more. We live within a framework that defines the present as eternally lacking and the future as eternally better. If we did not see things this way, we would not act at all. And this is reflected in uh, anticipation. Anticipation is one of the best things about traveling somewhere, right? You get excited about going somewhere. And often the anticipation can be uh, even greater for some people than the actual experience. As strange as that sounds, if you just notice the feeling of anticipation, it, it's, it can be almost just as great as the experience. But how can we benefit from our imaginativeness, our ability to improve the future without continually denigrating our current insufficiently successful and worthless lives? The first step perhaps is to take stock. Who are you? And that is reflected by the questions Peterson previously brought up before and I mentioned. Who actually are you? You need to know because you can't fix something if you don't know how it's broken and you're broken. We all are a little broken, if not a lot. You need an inspector, the internal critic, it could play that role if you could get it on track, if you and it could cooperate, because often that internal critic ain't on track, it's deluded. And when we talk about comparison, we talk about the idea of future and past, we're comparing the future to the past, the past to the future. And the future is like the past, but there's a crucial difference. The past is fixed, but the future, it could be better. It's somewhat malleable. Some people think it's fixed as well. Some people think it, this idea of fate. Everything's ha what's about to happen's already happened. Maybe that's true. But it could be better, surely. The future could be better. And the present is internally flawed, but where you start might not be as important as the direction you are heading. Perhaps happiness is always to be found in the journey uphill, in the process, in the grind, in the hard work, in the blood, sweat, tears, and not in the fleeting sense of satisfaction awaiting at the next peak. And this is reflected by what I said about before about anticipation. 
The uphill is the anticipation, the work to prepare. Much of happiness is hope, no matter how deep the underworld in which that hope was conceived. And then Jordan gives a very practical example of like, maybe you need to negotiate with yourself and have this type of self-talk and say, okay, I know we haven't gotten along very well in the past. This is talking to yourself. I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to improve. I'll probably make some more mistakes along the way, but I'll try and listen if you object. I'll try to learn. I noticed just now that you weren't really jumping at the opportunity to help when I asked. Again, internal conversation. Is there something I could offer in return for your cooperation? Maybe if you did the dishes, we could go for coffee. How about an espresso? Maybe a double shot. You know, you're negotiating with yourself uh, to get to get yourself to do something productive. And maybe this voice will reply, "Really? You really want to do something nice for me? You'll really do it? It's not a trick." And this is where you must be careful. That little voice, that's the voice of someone once burnt and twice shy. So you could say very carefully, really, I might not do it very well, and I might not be great company, but I will do something nice for you, I promise. A little careful kindness goes a long way, and a judicious reward is a powerful motivator. Now notice, this is an internal conversation with yourself. You're trying to become kinder and better for yourself to yourself. But this conversation can easily be had with another. This conversation is like a transcript of how you can do something nice and kind for somebody who is very skeptical and very like, oh, I don't know. I, ju I judge your intentions. I've been cheated on multiple times. This is kind of like a way you can maneuver around that delicate uh, porcelain doll of a human being that some people are. And then Peterson puts it back on other people. What could I say to someone else what could you say to someone else, your friend, your brother, your boss, or your assistant, that would set things a bit more right between us, between you and them tomorrow? What bit of chaos might I eradicate at home, on my desk, in my kitchen, so that the stage could be better set to play? What snakes might I banish from my closet and my mind? 500 small decisions, 500 tiny actions compose your day, today, and every day. Could you aim one or two of them at a better result? Could you do that? Because then you set up a cascade of events to happen that, that leave not only yourself a little better, but the person you conversated with and touched just a little bit, just like 1% better, right? Do that every day. That adds up to monumental progress over years. Monumental. Every decision matters. Every little, every, every, every breath of action matters. But aim small. You don't want to shoulder too much to begin with, given your limited talents, tendency to deceive, burden of resentment, and ability to shirk responsibility. Note, that may not actually be you. Or it actually may be you. Or it may be you a little bit, at some times. We're all a little bit like that sometimes, every now and again. So, you set yourself a goal. By the end of the day, I want things in my life to be a tiny bit better than they were this morning. And you ask yourself, what could I do, that I would do, that would accomplish that? And what small things would I like as a reward? Then you do what you have decided to do even if you do it badly. Then you give yourself that damn coffee, the reward, and triumph. Maybe you feel a bit stupid about it, but you do it anyway. And you do the same thing tomorrow and the next day. And with each day, your baseline of comparison, that standard that we were talking about earlier, gets a little higher. And that's magic. Because you've done it through yourself, not through the comparison of others. That's compound interest. Do that for three years, and your life will be entirely different. Now that you're aiming for something higher, now that you're wishing on a star, now the beam is disappearing from your eye and you're learning to see, slowly progressing up the, the, the hierarchy of, of kind of uh, progression. And what you aim at determines what you see. That's worth repeating. What you aim at determines what you see. And that is exemplified by this video. If you've already seen it, skip it. If you haven't, Watch it.
Notice, because the gorilla did not interfere with the ongoing, narrowly defined task, it was indistinguishable from everything else the participants didn't see. Why is this important? Well, this is a symbol. This, this is what we're talking about. That's how you deal with the overwhelming complexity of the world. You ignore it. The gorilla is the overwhelming complexity of the world. You ignore that gorilla. And while you concentrate minutely on your private concerns, which is the ball flying around. They're your private concerns. You see things that facilitate your movement forward towards your desired goals. You detect obstacles when they pop up in your path and you're blind to everything else. And there's a lot of everything else. So you're very blind. And it has to be that way because there is so much more of the world than there is of you. You must shepherd your limited resources carefully. Seeing is very difficult. So you must choose what you see and let the rest go because some people are aiming at that gorilla. They're aiming at the complexity of the world. They're aiming at their problems. They're aiming at the nihilism. They're aiming at nihilism. And that's not productive or fulfilling. What happens when we're in a crisis and we're ignoring a lot of the world around us? That's a terrible problem, but the problem contains the seeds of its own solution. Since you have this crisis, you have this problem, and you're blind to so much, you've ignored so much. So there's plenty of possibility left where you have not yet looked for the solution. So imagine you're unhappy. Maybe you are. And you're not getting what you need. Perversely, this may be because of what you want. You are blind because of what you desire. That's all you see. Perhaps what you really need is right in front of your eyes, but you cannot see it. It is a cliche, yes, but it is a true cliche. If you're not happy, perhaps it is your current knowledge that is insufficient, not life itself. Perhaps your value structure needs some serious retooling. Perhaps what you want is blinding you to what else could be. Perhaps you are holding onto your desires in the present so tightly that you cannot see anything else, even what you truly need. Imagine that you're thinking enviously of wanting your boss's job. You think, I'm unhappy. However, I could be cured of this unhappiness if I could fulfill my ambition of this job. But then you might think further, wait, maybe I'm not unhappy because I don't have my boss's job. Maybe I'm unhappy because I can't stop wanting the job. I can't stop lusting after this one thing. That doesn't mean you can just simply and magically tell yourself to stop wanting that job. Of course not. You're not just going to magically listen and transform. You won't, can't. In fact, just change yourself that easily. You have to dig deeper. You must change what you are after more profoundly. So you might think, I don't know what to do about this stupid suffering. I can't just abandon my ambitions. Fair enough. That would leave me nowhere to go. Fair enough. You might decide to take a different tack. Instead, you might ask for the revelation of a different plan. One that would fulfill your desires and gratify your ambitions in a real sense. And that would remove your life of the bitterness and resentment with which you are currently affected. So you make a different plan. I will try to want whatever it is that would make my life better. Whatever that might be. And I will start working on it now. So you have to distinguish whether what you want is actually going to make your life better. Or you're just justifying it and lying to yourself out of this ungrounded, superficial lust and greed. Maybe a bit of both. What would your life look like if it were better? What would life itself look like? What does better even mean? You gotta define that for yourself. It's different for everybody. You don't know. Most don't. And it doesn't matter what you don't know exactly right away because you will start to slowly see what is better once you have truly decided to want it. Because what you aim at is what you see. Remember. And this will only work, however, if you genuinely want your life to improve. You can't fool your implicit perceptual structures and you can't want it for somebody else. Man, I've tried, man. I've tried to inspire other people close to me that I care about, like to want a better life for themselves. But you just, I don't know how. I ain't no Dr. Phil, Oprah, you know. I'm not these people, maybe they can do it. I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist. It's with, not within my means at this point in time. So knowing this, you got to empower yourself and the individual so that you got to want it for yourself. To retool, to take stock, to aim somewhere better, you have to think it through bottom to top. You have to scour your psyche. Jeez, that's why I love writing. I'd encourage every single person listening, watching this to write. Journal, diary, medium.com, put it out to the world. Don't matter. Whatever works for you. Audio, talk to yourself. Some type of catharsis for 
mental masturbation and thoughts. You have to clean the damn thing up. The mind gets dirty, gets clogged. And you must be cautious because making your life better means adopting a lot of responsibility and that takes more effort and care than living stupidly in pain and remaining arrogant, deceitful and resentful. What if it was the case that the world revealed whatever goodness it contains in precise proportion to the, your desire for the best? Notice your desire, what you aim at. What if the world revealed itself? Because sometimes it just does. That's the power of aiming at something true. But just because you want something, you aim at something, doesn't mean the world will actually reveal itself. It's not the secret. This doesn't uh, the secret the book I'm referring to. Um, doesn't mean you can't. Doesn't mean that you can have what you merely want by wishing for it. Or that everything is interpretation of that there's no reality. The world is still there with structures and limits. As you move along it, it cooperates or objects to your action or inaction. Just added that in. Not just by sitting here and closing, you know, getting our fingers together and just wishing and hoping. Nope. If, you hear, if you're still watching this thinking that's going to happen, bye-bye. Leave. It's not what we're here for. It's not what's happening. It's not theology. It's not mysticism. It's empirical knowledge. There's no ma nothing magical here. If we start aiming at something, at something different, something like, I want my life to be better, more productive, more fulfilling, our minds will start presenting us with new information derived from the previously hidden world to aid us in that pursuit. Then we can put that information to use and move and act and observe and improve. Notice, act, observe, improve. Act is the key word I'm emphasizing right here. You must act. If you do not act, you do not move. Well, you do not move forward, rather me. If you inact, stay stagnant, you move backward. And discipline is a key core component to this. And it must be it's gonna be cultivated through action and through just tireless daily work. And you cannot aim yourself at anything if you are completely undisciplined and untutored. You will not know what to target and you won't fly straight, even if you somehow get your aim right. And then you'll conclude there is nothing to aim for, and then you'll be lost. Now let's return to the situation where your aim is being determined by something petty and superficial. Let's break it down. Four steps. Five steps that I highlighted. One. Imagine that you come to notice and contemplate and reconsider your unhappiness. You accept responsibility for it and you dare to posit that it might be something at least per partly under your control. Two, you crack open one eye for a moment and look. You ask for something better. You sacrifice your pettiness, repent of your envy and open your heart. Three, instead of cursing the darkness, you let in a little light. You decide to aim for a better life instead of a better office. Four, Realize that it's a mistake to aim for a better life if it comes at the cost of worsening someone else's. So you get creative. You decide to play a difficult game. Decide that you want a better life in a manner that would also make the life of your family and peers better. Five, your life indeed improves. You start to think further, better. Perhaps that means better for me and my family, my friends, even for my enemies. But that's not all it means. It means better today in a manner that makes everything better tomorrow, next week, next year, and a decade from now. A hundred years from now. A thousand years from now. Forever. This is, this is making a, a decision to live a better life today for yourself. Consequently, has a cascading effect that, that lasts forever. People are much more powerful than they think. Only they realized it. Only they realized it. Like, think about this. Every single video you watch on YouTube or Facebook that, that inspires you and tweaks your philosophy slightly, you're one person. Think about the thousands of other people that is occurring to and how they are then influencing other people. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, magnificent thing. Pay attention. Notice something that bothers you, that concerns you, which you could fix, that you would fix. You can find such things by asking yourself genuinely three questions. What is it that is bothering me? Is that something I could fix? And would I actually be willing to fix it? If you find the answer is no to any or all of the questions then look elsewhere, aim lower. Search until you find something that bothers you, that you could fix, that you would fix, and then fix it. That might be enough for the day. And this is, a, this is very simple. It's not about changing the world here. Maybe there's a stack of papers on your desk and you've been avoiding it. I'll get to it later. Get to it next week. It's bothering you though. Back of your head. You think about it every week. So that, 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 that would be better cleaned up. My environment would be better if I clean that up. 
You walk into your room, there are terrible things lurking there. Tax forms, bills, letters, people wanting things from you. Notice your fear, and you have some sympathy for it. Maybe there are sn snakes in that pile of paper. Metaphorical snakes. Maybe you'll get bitten. Maybe there are even hydras lurking in there. You'll cut one head off and seven more will grow. How could you possibly cope with that? This is a metaphor for people avoiding the little mundane problems that build up over their lives. So you could ask yourself, is there anything at all I might be willing to do about this pile of paper? Would I look maybe at one part of it for 20 minutes? Maybe the answer would be no. Nope, not doing it. What about 10 minutes? What about five minutes? What about one? How about one minute? How about you put a 60 second timer on and you start looking at a problem that you've been postponing and you work on it for 60 seconds. You start there, you start small. Because that's something. And you'll soon find the entire pile shrinks in significance merely because you've looked at a part of it. But what if you allowed yourself a glass of wine with dinner or curled up with on the sofa and read? Or watch a stupid movie as a reward? What if you instructed your wife or your husband to say good job after you fix whatever you fixed? Would that motivate you? Maybe, maybe not. It's up to you to find what motivates you. These are simply ideas. Ask yourself, what do you require to be motivated to undertake the job? Honestly, listen to the answer. Don't tell yourself, I shouldn't need to do that to motivate myself. What do you know about yourself? You got all these problems, and now you're saying, like, oh, who says I, should, I don't need to motivate myself? Well, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have this problem if you already knew the answer. So you might as well try it. You're the most complex thing. We are the most complex thing that the universe has ever constructed. Human beings. Don't ever overestimate your self-knowledge. Maybe you can do this in the morning as you sit on the edge of your bed. Maybe you can try the night before when you're preparing to sleep. Ask yourself for a voluntary contribution of understanding more about yourself and what motivates you. If you ask nicely, listen carefully, and don't try any treachery, you might be offered an answer. Do this every day for a while, just for a minute, 30 seconds, then do it for the rest of your life. And soon you will find yourself in different situations. You'll find that your aim changes and your life just gets better. It's like magic, but it's not. It's purposeful action. Aim high, set your sights on the betterment of being. There is habitable order to establish and beauty to bring into existence. There is evil to overcome, suffering to ameliorate, and yourself to be better. This is the expression not merely of admirable self-control and self-mastery, but of the fundamental desire to set the world right. This is why Jordan Peterson is one of the, the most profound thinkers and important thinkers of our time. Because he's articulating these ideas in a 2018 language for the, for the uh, layman, the lay person to understand and to transmute and to put into action. I don't need to be a scholar to understand him. Yeah, he talks up in the cloud sometimes. But these ideas are understood by someone with a, uh, any type of tertiary education or high school education. You can, kind of, you can get a grasp of these ideas and use some of them. So what do you do by doing all this? What happens? You are telling the truth instead of manipulating the world. You are negotiating instead of playing the martyr or the tyrant. You no longer have to be envious because you no longer know that someone else truly has a better. You no longer have to be frustrated because you have learned to aim low and to be patient. You are discovering who you are and what you want and what you are willing to do. You are finding that the solutions to your particular problems have to be tailored to you personally and precisely. You, have, you are less concerned with the actions of other people because you have plenty to do yourself now. Attend to the day but aim to the highest good. Now that your trajectory is heavenward, that makes you hopeful. If you ask, as if you want, and knock, as if you want to enter, you may be offered a chance to improve your life, and a little, a lot, completely, and with that improvement, some progress will be made in being itself. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. And that's made a lot easier when you just do all this stuff that he just mentioned. He set it up. The blueprint is here. And go do.